So, Zach has spoken to you about how important economics has become and how economic expertise shapes public debate and powerful institutions. I want to speak to you about how one type of economics dominates the education of economic experts, how this economics is taught uncritically and the damaging consequences that this has for society. When asking students from across the campaign to reform economics education why they chose to study economics, they gave us reasons such as, I wanted to understand how society as a whole functions, I realised that those who understood economics understood power, and I had an infantile frustration over not understanding what the grown-ups were talking about. <laughs> These students intuitively realised the role that economics plays in society and wanted to study it to understand the world around them. Yet on entering an economics education, students may find themselves surprised and disorientated. Far from engaging with the issues they grew up hearing about in the news, they could be forgiven for thinking that they've been transported to an alternate reality. The focus is on the memorization of abstract theory, solving mathematical models, and a slew of jargon and definitions. This type of economics is known as neoclassical economics. We give an in-depth definition in the book, but for today's purposes, neoclassical economics can be defined as a particular type of mathematical modelling that assumes the economy can be represented by predictable mechanical relationships. Economists might argue that students must be introduced to the toolkit of economics before they can apply it. But in economics education, the focus often seems to be on the toolkit itself, rather than which problems it's supposed to solve, how well it does this, and crucially, its limitations and blind spots. This form of economics is taught as if it is economics. And the notion that there may be other ways to study economics is completely absent from most classrooms. To find out how economists are educated, we carried out a curriculum review of 174 modules at uh, seven Russell Group universities, examining the course outlines and final exams. We found that among all economics modules, 76% of exam questions did not require the student to exercise any critical thinking. That is, to formulate an independent, reasoned argument. When only compulsory modules are included, this increases to 92%. The majority of marks are instead given for regurgitating theories and solving mathematics, so most questions only have one right answer. What this means is that the next generation of economic experts are not taught to think about the economy critically. In the words of one student, I had always thought of economics as a lively debate, that is, until I started studying it at university. <laughs> Neoclassical economics has some strengths, and we are not suggesting it should be thrown out entirely. However, we feel the economics profession has cornered the market on books praising the economics profession, so with titles like The Trillion Dollar Economists, How Economists and Their Ideas Have Transformed Business, Free economics, a rogue economist explores the hidden side of everything, and the economic naturalist, why economics explains almost everything. So for this reason, we think it's appropriate to focus on its limitations. <laughs> two examples from recent history illustrate in two very different ways the limits of current economic expertise. The 2008 financial crisis and Brexit. The crisis illustrated the dangers of an intellectual monoculture, while Brexit illustrated the dangers of seeing economics as a purely technocratic discipline. We argue that reforming economics education will produce better experts, but that we also need to turn economics into a public dialogue. In the run-up to the financial crisis, neoclassical economic ideas were used extensively by governments and central banks. Central bank independence and the idea that stability would follow by using interest rates to manage inflation came directly out of economics textbooks and were adopted by governments across the world. Prior to the crisis, economists demonstrated extraordinary levels of hubris. The former governor of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, praised economists for bringing about the Great Moderation, a period of low inflation and high growth. The famous economist Robert Lucas declared that the central problem of depression prevention had been solved. But this stability proved to be a mirage, and the tools used by economists left them blind to the problems brewing in the housing market and the financial sector. As we all know, this had catastrophic consequences when the bubble burst. The crisis illustrates how subtle decisions, even those about how we define and measure the economy, can influence how it functions. Central banks targeted a measure of inflation, the consumer price index, which excluded house prices. And the fastest growth in lending came from financial institutions in the category marked Other Financial Corporations by the Bank of England. 
This is also where ideas from outside neoclassical economics show their worth. One example is Hyman Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, which spoke of how investors would gradually become overconfident in tranquil times, so that stability breeds instability. Though Minsky died long before the crisis, those who foresaw it happening almost invariably drew from his insights. How we think about economics shapes how we understand the economy. For example, ecological economics, which was not taught at any economics department in our sample, leads us to view the economy as interconnected with and dependent on the ecosystem. This leads ecological economists to consider the limits to growth, an idea completely absent from neoclassical economics. We explore similar examples of the insights offered by other perspectives throughout the book. But to return to Brexit, it's clear that Brexit implicates the economics profession less directly than the financial crisis. But it highlights what is potentially an even more important issue, that the profession is completely out of touch with the general public. As Zach has discussed, the economics establishment was unanimous in its opposition to Brexit. They made predictions about falls in GDP and trade using techniques such as gravity models and econometrics, thought of as rigorous amongst, amongst economists. But these were simply dismissed as project fear. They were either disbelieved by or did not resonate with a majority of voters. The profession monumentally failed to convince the population. As much was admitted by the director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, Paul Johnson, who took responsibility for the fact that, as he put it, Economists' warnings were not understood or believed by many. Thus, while pluralism in economics education, in powerful economic institutions and in public debate would be an enormous step forward, it would not be enough. Economists of all stripes have to re-engage with the public if we are to reclaim the relationship between expertise and democracy. <laughs> the present belief in economics as a collection of technical tools, inaccessible to anyone not trained in economics, devalues the role of non-expert citizens. Even those who admit the failures uh, in the discipline's inability to communicate seem to believe that it is the public who should come round to economists' way of thinking. This is why we put forward the idea of the public interest economist. Public interest economists would look to hold the powerful to account, take seriously the challenge of creating participatory economic institutions, and play a crucial role in public education. They would accept the social responsibility that comes with the authority granted by their expertise. Public interest economics would recognise that citizens can often have valuable knowledge and insights that experts may lack. Engagement with and education of citizens would necessarily be accompanied by a respect for them and the experts' own willingness to learn. The science communication movement offers some clues in this direction, having long recognised that educating the public does not only flow in one direction from expert to public, but benefits both parties more if there is a two-way interaction. This is even more true in a social science such as economics, because experts and the public may have differing opinions about which aspects of the economy are important and how to judge the success of policies. Democratizing economics would not only be a one-way street. We must create a society in which citizens are able to educate themselves. Doing this is an enormous challenge, but it's crucial for reinvigorating democracy. The seeds of change are already being sown. Firstly, with prominent institutions such as the Bank of England and the Government Economic Service showing openness to new ideas. Secondly, with the student movement and other organisations setting up community crash courses in economics, conferences designed to be accessible to everyone, and public education websites. In this sense, we are trying to be the change that we want to see. However, we know that we need to go a lot further. And to do that, we have to go from being a student movement to being a social movement. Thank you.